Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for another session during Fulbright Awareness Week. I am Judy Travis and I am with the UF Graduate School. I am the Associate Dean for Graduate Student Affairs. Um, I'm here with Claire Anumba from the Inter International Center and Luis Johnson from the International Center. And we're gonna guide you through managing full Fulbright recruitment and retention. As you know, we are different faces probably than you've seen in the past. Deborah Anderson and Matt Materko uh, previously filled the roles of Claire and myself. And so it is my first venture as well as Claire's on the Fulbright process. With that came a lot of learning as well as troubleshooting. Um, and I hope for the future, we're having the right conversations as we move forward in this domain in recruiting Fulbright scholars. Okay, so what is the Fulbright Foreign Student Program? Okay, so this was um, developed with Senator William Fulbright around 1946, and it was to promote kind of international goodwill and exchange of students in the educational, cultural, and science process. It's housed within the Department of State in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. It's a shared funding with U.S. governments and the foreign governments in which the students are coming from, and they, they really want this cost-sharing relationship to happen. Approximately 8,000 awards are offered each year where these students go to multiple institutions across the United States. So there are different types of Fulbright programs, as you know. Um, there are the student programs, which um, our students can go abroad as well as international students coming to the United States. Then we have, which is a little bit more of Luis's area, is the faculty side of things, where we have our visiting scholars or researchers or our Fulbright scholar that's coming to the university to either work in a lab or gain research knowledge or that such. So what is the Fulbright Foreign Student Fellowship Program? It provides fellowships for international students who are going to pursue a graduate degree in the United States. It's awarded, the award provide, it's provided to the incoming students. The fellowship has an overall budget for all included items. It Now this is de varies depending on the student and where they're coming from. Typically there, in what I see as of late, their fellowship packages will offer a stipend typically, it will offer some cost for the tuition and fees, a possible travel expense to get them back and forth, books and living expenses. Typically that's their package that they're getting, but it is country dependent. Um, as I said, it's country, to, depending on the country, it could switch those kind of parameters. This is a link to the Foreign Fulbright Online Org Program where you can read more information on the program. So what are the requirements for the Fulbright Foreign Student Fellowship Program? Um, paid, it's the outside, it, the Fulbright agency and the home country are paying on behalf of the student. The enrollment credits, even though they are fellows, there is an agreement where these students will register for nine credits in the fall and spring and six in the summer if summer registration is required. They must pursue re, uh, education in person. It cannot be an online degree. Um, oops, sorry. Um, they cannot, there are some restrictions on the program, like they cannot have direct patient contact. The sponsoring agency handles the visa issues and satisfactory progress. They cannot do research outside the US during Fulbright, except for visits to the home country. And awards have a total budget amount for each individual incoming Fulbright student. So what does that funding package look like? As I mentioned, it's the stipend is set by the Department of State. Um, it typically includes the cost of living, which is set by the region. It typically will include some portion of a health insurance. Um, I do, um, and Claire, you can help me out. Their health insurance that they paid is not the UF minimum or the UF requirement. So there is you know, extra cost there. Um, some partial tuition, 
and fees is covered, but they really like cost sharing in this area. Um, some allowance for transition, whether it's settling in, living expenses, books, computer, travel to the U.S. Um, and there are some programs that will allow for related programs, such as the English, English Language Institute, um, training at the U.S. institution before um, pre-arrival. So what's the application process? So the Fulbright Agency, the three that we mainly deal with here are the LASPAU, L-A-S-P-A-U, which deal with Latin America and Caribbean, AMID East, which is the uh, MENA region, and IIE Worldwide. Typically, we see here at UF, LASPAU and IIE, and those agencies essentially collect all of the information for out the application for that student and already gather those materials and send them to the admissions here at UF. Um, I get copied on that email um, with their whole application dossier um, and it's shepherded over to admissions. They um, kind of network with these agencies to tell them you know, what's missing. And then once the package is complete, they'll send it off to the unit for review um, for an admission decision. Um, our, the agents, the internal people that are working on that is our admissions office, the International Center, and the Graduate School. What is the Fulbright application process? So these students will apply typically um, spring 2022 now um, with an award notification or last spring with an award notification in the fall of 2022. Um, it's more a year in advance from when they're gonna come here. At UF, um, the applications are submitted in fall 22, spring 23, like I'm still seeing a few trickle in. Um, um, by the placement agency. Um, those should have the test scores, the credentials needed to meet the UF requirements, any placement, language test, all of that should be in that dossier that they give you um, in the application. So admissions handles all the credentials. The graduate school here can assist with if you're going to do an offer with some funding or cost sharing, we can look over your letters. Um, and the, But really, um, you will network, the departments will network with the Fulbright agency on the, if you're going to give a um, funding agreement and they will be able to share a little bit more detail with you about their contribution. They, their LASPAO is very good about spelling it out um, at the very beginning. Um, IIE, I think they want to do it when you're negotiating the funding award or the offer um, that you would like to give that student. And that's when they'll share it with either the faculty or the contact in that unit. And then you all would send the admission letter or release the admission decision. And if there is a letter of offer. So what's, what are our funding goals? You know, we would like you to um, provide funding similar to what the program provides to a typical graduate student, um, obviously set to the minimums of the GAU bargaining agreement. We understand that these students are already getting a stipend typically from their being a Fulbright. And so we are um, willing to see um, your contribution kind of with theirs equal that minimum, if you will. So it could be instead of maybe a 0 0.50, you have it at a 0 0.25 with you know a stipend level that will meet the combined minimum, if you will. And we could see a petition on that and, and approve that. And we would like it to be multi-year. Some of these students are here two years, some of them are three, and some of them are all five years. So this is something that we learned um, uh, quite a bit up this fall, and um, we're still researching it with myself, um, Dean Wayne at the uh, International Center, as well as uh, Dean Stedman in the grad school, regarding all the funding types that we have for the Fulbrights. It seems that there's not one true funding or waiver type these students receive. From my research, they can receive, you can, if they're from a Latin American designated country, 
they can reserve the uh, they can receive the LAC award if they receive a minimum. I believe it's a five hundred dollars scholarship. Um, UFIC currently oversees this. There's also what's called the provost waiver. This is a waiver that is through the graduate school. We have a limited number. We only get 20 for new and renewing students. And this year, um, I have a lot of renewing students that were on five-year grants um, with um, their agreement. And so I wasn't able to contribute as much as I would like to provide units with the provost waiver. And what that does is it pays the difference in the in-state and out-of-state rate, leaving the in-state to be paid by either the funding agency or the student. And then there are other departmental agreements that we uh, realized that, um, have an agreement with the provost on a waiver. Um, Latin American studies has, has one with them, as well as we believe class, but this is also being researched by uh, Dean uh, Wayne on other units, if there's other agreements out there with Fulbrights. So we like to see cost sharing for these students. This can come up to um, top ups, whether they are scholarships, uh, we, I've seen scholarships be used. I've seen assistantships with departments be used. Some have used their Grinter Fellowship or awards, as well as compare, um, combining it with the LAC scholarship. Um, there may be a waiver payment um, to help compensate tuition, whether it's through the college, Latin American Studies, our provost waiver through the grad school, or using the LAC, or contributing to the health insurance. Some is covered by the Fulbright, but kind of getting another policy um, to help bring them up to the UF minimum. So typically you have a you can have a standard offer of a just admission. Like if you're not, if you want the student and you really want them to be a part of your program, but you're not going to offer them any funding, that's fine. You can offer a standard admission offer. You could do an offer with an assistantship or other type of funding. Um, uh, and just outline that in the process of what they are entitled to and what how long you're you're going to be offering them that funding. Um, and then you providing them that in writing, like this is what we'll contribute to. If you would like us again to see those offer letters that you're going to offer funding, we'd be glad to do that because some of the agencies, when you write tuition waiver, they take it as you're going to take care of all of the tuition in state, out of state, all of that. Um, and so we wanna be really clear on what you would like to pay. So after admissions, two forms are needed for students to enroll at UF. There is a university financial award form that you most of you are probably aware of. Um, it's uh, to be completed once the student decides to enroll at UF. Um, also required each year, is, uh, it's required every year for the student to, that has a Fulbright Award. Uh, we will confirm any institutional cost sharing of any kind. This form arrives typically to me late spring. I have seen it go directly to the student, um, especially if that student has an assistantship and the graduate school can sign off on that. And then I have been receiving renewal forms for our current Fulbrighters for um, that cost sharing um, funding to still um, continue. Uh, we receive those. Um, the terms of the appointments are sent to the UF International Center um, by the sponsoring agency. So IIE or LESPAO will send that to UFIC um, so they know what the students have. Um, it'll confirm the details of the funding offer uh, for the sponsor student and the bursar's office because the bursar's office will eventually um, bill what they need to bill to the agency. And then that's shared with all the relevant parties at UF to facilitate the billing. Um, how do we support our students after admission? I think, is this Claire, is this you? Yeah, this is my bit. Thanks, Judy. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Number, and I work at UFIC. Um, so I act as the campus advisor when they're on campus after they get here. So they have a, um, a Fulbright funding 
advisor and then they have um, and then I act as the advisor on campus. So I work with a Fulbright advisor. We work together to help the student. So as Judy has, has said, um, there's lots of negotiations goes on with the funding agency, with the grad school and with the department for the student to be offered a package, funding package. And then once everything is set, the student accepts the admission. And then the funding agency, IE or LASPAO, will, um, will, will deal with their immigration documents. So they will provide them with the DS 2019, which they will need to go to the, the US embassy in their home country to get a visa. And once they've got their visa and everything is sorted, then they can come into the US 30 days before the start of their program. So the DS 2019 will have a start date. And so they can enter the US 30 days before the start date of the program. Once the student gets here, they must check in, they must come to the International Center and check in with me. I take copies of all their immigration documents and their um, terms of um, agreement with their funding agency. So IIE or LASPA will give them a terms of agreement which lists everything that they will, that, um, the Fulbright will provide and what UF will provide. Next slide, please, Julie. So sometimes when for most students, um, their studies will come will continue after the uh, Fulbright funding is complete, especially for doctoral students. So in that situation, they will have to transfer their funding from Fulbright to mostly UF funding. The department will then be responsible for um, completely for, the, for their funding because the Fulbright funding would have, would have completed. So um, the student will require, the student will, will let me know that they're transferring their, their visa from Fulbright to UF. And so they'll have to um, show proof of funding. So if the department is going to fund them, They'll have to show, I have to get a letter or confirmation from the department saying what the department will be funding them for. And once they have everything, then uh, I work with Louise's unit and Fulbright will transfer their immigration um, document to UF. So then UF will issue the DS-2019. So the waiver processing, as Judy had said, there are three main ones, the Latin American Studies Agreement, the set number of waivers available for Las Pau Fulbrights. Um, this is only for students from Latin America. And like Judy said, it's used to build a funding package <coughs> coordinated by Latin American Studies and typically accompanied with LAC. And then there's LAC, which um, is currently coordinated by UF that might change, by UFIC might change in the future. It must be from federal or state funding. So what happens is every semester, we require the, the department to confirm that the student will be getting a LAC um, scholarship for that semester and they'll be getting $500. The $500 can go directly to the student or it can go towards their tuition. And then there's the provost um, waiver, which was coordinated by Judy at the grad school, used to build a funding package. And like Judy has said, there's a set number available and offered for the duration of the Fulbright award. So once the student get on camp gets on campus, like I said, they have to um, notify me because like Judy said, IIE or LASPA will send me the terms of agreement once um, the, the offer of admission has been issued and the student has um, accepted the offer. And then we try to, once they're here, we try to integrate Fulbright students already on campus. So for example, the Fulbright chapter will host events that will bring all the students together um, and also every year the president's office has a, will host a Fulbright reception. So all the students, everybody who has anything to do with Fulbright on campus is invited. And also once they come, they have to check in with me and I take copies of their documents. 
to institutional responsibilities, the placement agency has to fund the student, make all efforts to fund the students to degree completion. If not, um, then the student has to transfer their visa to UF or I guess privately. Um, they have to provide updates on student status change and satisfactory progress. Um, the student has to be provided academic and language support if needed. And then to UFI, provide updates on student status change. And once Fulbright funding is complete, assist in visa transfer. I'll hand it over to Luis to talk about the scholars. Thank you, Claire. Um, can we move on, Judy, please? Thank you. Um, so with the international scholars, um, things are a little bit different. Um, unfortunately, I am not notified beforehand, like Claire is, when we have international Fulbright scholars coming on campus. So I heavily rely on um, the departments to let me know that they will have, they will be hosting a Fulbright visitor. Um, the way it works for us, usually the faculty, a faculty member is either approached by a Fulbright scholarship recipient or they already have um, any type of, of uh, ties with uh, uh, an institution or a certain uh, scholar that they would like to host. Um, the, ideally, the way you, you should work is um, the faculty would then contact me. Um, I would help him with, um, you know, an offer and uh, conditional offer letter uh, and some details. We would work with their with their uh, with the faculty's home department here at UF, you know, to to create everything and and um, give the scholar a UF ID and things would go from there. And then just like it happens with the students. The agencies, um, IIE, Les Powell, Amidis, so forth and so on, they would issue the scholars the S2019. The scholar would arrive and then check in with me, um, and which is a, is a, it's a quick session just um, so I can um, provide some resources available for them. Um, at UF, we accept all. Uh, fields of study, we accept scholars and professors. So um, both both categories within the J1 are accepted for Fulbright here. Um, we do not charge any fees, any extra fees um, for Fulbright. Uh, and they will receive, um, you know, the funding from Fulbright to, uh, you know, pursue their research. Uh, sometimes I'm, from what I'm seeing lately, it's been um, a little bit more rare, but in the past, Fulbright used to provide uh, a bench fee sometimes for the faculty member. Uh, I haven't seen that in quite a while, I should say. I don't know if there was like any policy change um, or anything, but yes. And then um, from that point on, they will stay for, I, between three months to a year um, pursuing their research while they are here. Can we move one more, Judy, please? Uh, again, I highly, like I said in the beginning, I highly depend on the host departments uh, contacting me to let me know that a Fulbright scholar is coming and I'm more than happy to work uh, with all the parties involved. Um, we are, able to point out to resources like off-campus housing when it comes to finding a place. Um, that has become more and more difficult here in Gainesville, especially for the ones that are here just for you know, two or three months. Um, it's, it's really hard to find a short-term lease, um, in which case you know, we try to look at other options like an uh, Airbnb, et cetera. Um, the department, the department uh, usually tell us whether or not they will have an office space for uh, the Fulbright visitor. We just ask that they have, it doesn't necessarily need to be an office space, but they need to have a workspace for the visitor. 
um, we try to integrate them with all of the community activities, all the activities that we host here at the International Center. Um, and I always appreciate um, when departments or the visitors let me know that they have completed their program and you know they're either leaving the United States, they're moving on somehow. Any questions so far? Okay. Well, that's in a nutshell um, what the uh, Fulbright Scholar looks like. Again, it's very different from, I see you, Scott. <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit different from the, the, the student side a little bit. I mean, they're usually older they, and, and, and they are looking forward to engaging, you know, both academically and, and culturally. Uh, but, you know, we still have the, the hurdles of <laughs> trying to figure out who we are hosting as a university. Yes, yeah, Scott. So one of the important things I, I just want to add is that, you know, working with the students and the scholars for many years is um, we want these Fulbright individuals here, right? We want them here. They are already put through all types of rigorous application processes, and they are the best of the best of the best, right? They have uh, credentials far and wide. So we want them here. Um, with that said, I just have a couple of questions. First was is for Judy. So Judy, um, previously with Matt Maturko's position, I know it was important in that position that they facilitated with departments who were looking to admit either a graduate or undergraduate Fulbright student, um, timely, admission decisions because we prior to Matt's position we were having issues with students wanting to come to UF but then departments weren't making timely admission decisions and these students were going elsewhere is that still something that you are correct so we I, ha I asked uh, admissions to provide so what's a little different between me and Matt is I've actually captured all the admissions emails that come to my inbox and created a teams page that I think some of us are on Fulbright with each of the email correspondences, not only from the agency to UF, right. but also the agency to the department. Then I asked uh, admissions to pull me a list of uh, those that applied um, that were Fulbright um, and went through their files to try to find as much detail as I can of the funding that they will be getting. And there are some that have admissions decisions, but there are a majority that are not. And so what I was going to do, I talked to uh, Marta, uh, we had a meeting about this yesterday, is I what I will do is I asked for the department as well, and I believe we decided we would send their list to the graduate coordinator to say, hey, can you please make a decision on these students, and, you know, bef especially before the April 15th deadline, um, which is, you know, in a couple of weeks. So yes, timely decisions would be helpful to the agencies as well. Oh, thank you for sure. that. Um, the next question also for Judy. So I also know in the past, um, again, with Matt's position when he was there. Um, there are certain fields of study, certain majors that we know, right, that a four-year funding from Fulbright for a PhD in mechanical engineering, I'm just giving you an example, it's not going to, it's not going to be four years. We know that. Mm -hmm. We have somebody at the College of Education, they're in a four-year PhD program, they're going to finish in four years, right. right? But we know in certain program areas, it's not going to happen. Do you in advance work, try to work with those departments before, like to say, hey, we understand that there's, you know, these students typically take five years, the funding's for four. We need to make sure that they have funding now. And we're not trying to figure out funding at year three and a half or four. Do you still work with the departments yeah, to make sure that I that's available? Yeah, I think that's with any of time, type of right? graduate student okay. that even if their letter says four years, that if they, for some reason, they could not complete their program in that time frame, okay. you know, it should fall to the department to try to pick that, you know, candidate back to complete their admission or their, their academic program in that manner. Um, I would, we'd, we'd treat that with any graduate student. Um, but yeah, but see, here's the, 
The graduate school doesn't become involved in the negotiations. It's only when the department reaches out to the graduate school. And that's how it worked with Matt as well. It's okay. when um, the department reaches out to say, can I have a provost waiver? Or here's here's what we're going to offer. Is this OK? Um, but we that's what we would want to see is that um, if you're going to fund the student to really fund them comparable to what an incoming grad that you would fund any right. graduate student like but I like your point Scott I didn't realize when I took this on the amount of Fulbright students we have 67 just for fall 2023 that I've tracked yeah. that is recruitment in a bucket for departments sure. like that Pakistan not not you know Indo Indonesia like all oh, over the place that and you're right they've already vetted these individuals and it in the long run it might be helpful for colleges you know that can't go out and recruit to these countries that they're right here and I think Marta and myself have talked about this that we have to do, build this network a little bit stronger to get this information to the departments and also what does funding look like now? Yeah. Because um, the provo, I mean, that's not I mean, good. Yeah, it's and just the it's I not. Think... Yeah, for these right. highly recruit these students, there it needs there needs to be a little bit more incentive, um, so they come here. So. And the reason I ask that because in my aspect, when I was at the International Center, I worked with the incoming scholars and professors, but then I also had the J one students. So mm -hmm. when the students transferred from Fulbright their immigration status from Fulbright to UF sponsorship, and I had those students as well. Um, but we did run into a couple of times before Matt, this is why I asked, uh, before the graduate school really got involved the way they are now, is um, they'd get to the end of their four years and the professor was like, guess what, I have no funding for them. And now we were in the danger of this student not being able to complete a degree and having to go, right? Right. Um, so I wanna even say, I was in discussions prior to individuals coming in about if a department, they had to make sure that they had available money, Correct. you know, that was very, very important. But so anyways, thank you for all that. Um, do we happen to know how many different countries, not the names, but how many countries um, we have Fulbright folks from right now? I'm just curious. Yeah, let me um, let me get into my Teams page. Because um, oftentimes it's impressive, so. Um, and, and Scott, just to piggyback on what you said about the transfer, there are also some commissions that do not transfer that's right their Fulbright students once the fund like Pakistan is notorious for that like right. sometimes they are six months from from finishing their degree they make right. the student go back apply for an F visa and then come back to, to finish and, and I think an important an or, important aspect for you Louise when you were talking about there was a little areas that said what the UFIC responsible for once the students transfer. They're also now the responsible for advising on their immigration status because Fulbright's responsible for this for the individuals as when they're a sponsor. But once they're sponsored by UF, they do that transfer, then your you know your unit's responsible for them and their immigration status and their immigration Just like advising. Any other US yeah. Student, yeah. So we have them we have them fully, yeah, for sure. Um question real quick for you, Louise. Um, um, and this might, yeah. Do you guys still, and this might be for Claire, but do you guys still have um, for scholars like uh, a, the template for the offer or invitation letter? That's all, I'm asked that question. You still have that kind of yeah. template that yes, we can refer you to? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, anybody in the room, if you get a, a request, a faculty gets a request from a Fulbright, and one of the things they need is an invitation or an offer letter. The International Center has templates you can use, so you don't have to come up with that on your own. It's very helpful. I'll, run, so I'll run through some countries, and then we have a question from Dr. McCausland. Sure. But right now, Malaysia, Indonesia, Trinidad, Tobago, Pakistan, Colombia, Guyana, India, Pakistan, Mali, Paraguay, again, Pakistan, again, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Tanzania, Chile, Spain, Philippines, Russia, Colombia. Mexico, Argentina, Haiti. Um, did I say Paraguay already? Um, I said Chile. Honduras, Brazil, Guatemala, Nepal, Mongolia, Timor Leste, uh, Chile, Burma, my, my, which is Myanmar, Dominican Republic. Oh, really? Republic. Um, okay, those are the same. 
Bhutan, Bangladesh. So those are the countries. Wow. And there's 60 I have right now. And these are the ones that the applications identified as Fulbright um, 71, actually. Yeah, 71. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. McCausland, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, this has been really helpful. Thank you, Judy and Luis. Oh, I hope right. because we all are new and we're... <laughs> I'm searching Matt's emails for stuff like... like uh, Big shoes okay. to fill, but but you'll be great. My question is: I understand that this is an this is a a cultural exchange, and of course, online sitting in your bedroom taking classes online is not a cultural exchange. But as you know, we have twelve research and education centers around the state where there's at least ten faculty, sometimes thirty, and at least ten graduate students, and sometimes forty. And I'm just wondering if there's any uh, push from UFIC to allow, to ask, re-ask some of these agencies whether they wouldn't consider having a student based at an REC. Now they will be taking their courses online as do many of our students sitting here in Gainesville, right? We take, they take a lot of their courses online, but they wouldn't be sitting in their bedroom for their other 24 hours of the day. They'd be working side by side with, you know, 10, 11 faculty and 10, 15, 20 graduate students. You've, you've heard that, Judy, right? That right. So the, actually, I, I've spoken with um, in the panhandle um, just recently. Silvana. Yes, who wants to take on a Fulbright? So I think that should be fuller. I think that's a little different than a student just being not engaged with UF faculty doing research um, that's, you know, somewhere else. Um, in the in the states, kind of not connected to the institution. So I think that would be something that Marta could follow up on with the agencies, because I know that we do want to have a conversation with IIE on things of this nature and funding, being more transparent with their funding to their students so that mm -hmm. the departments can see that. Because I will say the majority of our students are IIE. Yeah. They're well, if Marta wants to know anything about, you know, our RECs from our smallest to our okay. biggest, you know, please let her know. She can contact okay. me. I'll, I'll help her paint the picture that this is not some remote place sitting in a shack, you know, with nobody to interact with. That it's a, it's a vibrant educational campus. It's just one of, uh, one of another. It's called a campus. It, RECs are campuses. Yeah. The other issue that I see, um, and again, Fulbright, Fulbright. Even for J-1 uh, regulation, Fulbright, they have their own regulation, right? They are the government. They, 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 they do what they want. Um, and the other issue I see sometimes with RECs is that the students, not the scholars, the, the scholars would be fine, but the students do need to meet physical presence requirements. Mm -hmm. So if the REC is not able to, um, you know, fall within the category of having X amount of credits taught in physical presence, then probably the agency would not authorize the students to go there. With a scholar, as I said, it's completely different because scholars are doing research. Right. So they can go, they can go anywhere. Um, so we we have lots of graduates, international graduate students at RECs, and Al Waisaki in, in Dean Turner's office makes sure they all meet physical presence. So often that means having an, an in-class presentation. Um, not coming to Gainesville, but but having a, a presentation in front of faculty there or having a proctored exam. So we make sure all our international students meet physical presence. And, and so those are right, F1s. Any... They're F1s. They're on an F1 visa. The ones and, who, and Fulbright's oh, come, come on a J1. So it's a different visa. And the physical presence requirements are different than the F1 scholar? They are oh. different, yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, I do have one J1, and again, he's not Fulbright, he's UFs, right? I do have one J1 in one out of our RECs, um, and the way that we we were able to make it happen is that um, he, he instead of starting with his, uh, his class, uh, class credit portion of, the, um, of his PhD, he started with the research portion. So, but so he will have to eventually move here to Gainesville to continue with his PhD. He wouldn't be able to do it at the REC. 
Uh, I I saw somebody else. I think they had their their hands up. I have a question um, for Dr. Travis. Um, I'm Victoria from the Department of Environmental and Global Health, and as you can imagine, we have plenty of um, international students since we are global health. And um, my uh, PhD program director did reach out recently to you regarding the out-of-state tuition waiver. And so I, I knew the answer already about you only have 20. Um, it's become quite a challenge for some of my faculty because of funding and that extra piece. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to turn down those students because of that, you know, that huge difference in money that they have to make up. So my question is, have you heard or is there any way to speak to the provost about potentially expanding so that, that? That's where it is. That's where we are. Okay. So um, it is now, mind you, it's 20, 20 spots for renewing and continuing. It's not new. I don't get 20 every year. Yeah, it's so um, And so the dean, the two deans, um, I gave them this information. We're all, I... At UF, it's hard to find things written down. So whenever this came to fruition, it was great at that time, but obviously the capacity of students applying at festival rights have expanded. And so we first we have to research who has these special agreements with the provost because class has their own College of Liberal Arts. They have an agreement with Fulbright for Fulbrights. There is this waiver land for provost waiver for the grad school. Latin American studies upstairs from us has their own agreement. So we don't know, like, does the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences have an agreement? So Marta's trying to research that. She's also, she and the dean have met with the provost about this. Um, her next inquiry was with George Kolb, who was around at that time this agreement came about so that they can tell us the number of waivers that are out there for this population. Um, but it's not just giving you guys waivers, it's it's kind of trying to figure out what is a really, um, you know, kind of if you are familiar with McKnight's or that kind of that cost sharing breakdown, like maybe a 0 0.24 or 0.25 assistantship and, you know, re-looking re at that. Um, so it, we're, we're really on an information search um, because it's not written down anywhere. And I think the data that I just got with um, admissions and then reading through their funding letters of, from, um, really LISPAL does a really good job of spelling it out. Uh, IIE does not. Um, and I don't have any M at East. So like knowing that, wow, we have 72 um, and it's just gonna continue to grow. I think there might be um, a way that both deans can go to either the current president, uh, provost or the new provost to say, if we want an international presence, um, this is a good opportunity. Um, yeah, so I think that's where we are, Victoria. I think we're, but any little, they'll take, you know, I will say, if you can't bring them up to your minimum, it's that's not the requirement. You know, over in the engineering, they do a fellowship, like they do a like scholarship, you know. So you could even do that little bit, like uh, we'll pay you like three thousand dollars or whatever. You know, they may consider that and say, okay, cool, I can make up the rest. So yeah. please know, I know it's not the greatest, but like our, our college will not allow okay. it to go. But we have a college minimum for all of them yes. and it's quite high compared to in from what we've seen across campus and they won't let us go below um i just feel like we're going to miss out we have one right now that we're looking at and we just don't we don't think we can afford him so the money you have that you for your all of your graduate students you couldn't use some of that for this international Oh, they, they do a lot of creative things in this okay. department, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, okay. We did bring a Fulbright on this past year for the first time, and and uh, so that was that one's been great. Okay. We do a lot of creative moving things around, and it's just this one we're really struggling with, I think. I think even if your voices could be, you know, leadership within your college when they're sitting in meetings with higher leaders here at the UF, you know, the the... The prestigiousness of a Fulbright, 
um, having that designation as a university in rankings, all of that. And we have them sitting here and not being able to really take them. So it's hard. It's a really hard situation for us. So I would encourage the, your leadership to whoever they can talk to as well. But please know it is Marta, Nicole, and myself, um, Claire. We we had a meeting with Claire um, and the Bursar office uh, because we all want to see this kind of get enhanced. So oh, I think that was it. Any other questions or Dr. Mikuzle, we can talk about it. I mean, there is still may, may be a possibility for the RECs. I just don't want to you know, yeah. throw a bucket of cold water on your idea, which I think it's a great idea. Uh, I just wanted to caution you that there, there could be more, you know, things hidden underneath. But um, it would be some, again, it would all depend on the agency too, because we won't be the sponsors. But I can think of one or two things that we could, probably try to to look at and see if that would work. So so what what is the difference between the J1 and the F1 physical presence requirements? So the J1 the F1s they can only do 3 credits of uh, online courses. Mm -hmm. The J1s it doesn't matter how many credits they can do but they can only do one course online. All of the it could be like a one 7 credit course online in a two credit, you know, physical presence course, that's fine, but they can only do one course. One course in their entire period, that one course in their entire program? One course per semester. So that's, they that have still work. That sounds, that sounds better. Yeah, it, it could work. That's why yeah. I said, I was like, there's a way, there is a way to make it work. Um, but, uh, Again, there there is that. What I was trying to say, like there is there are things behind it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, as as long as I E I I E knows that you know we are able to meet the physical presence we have done, we will continue to do so. And they're not sitting in their dorm room all by themselves. Maybe yeah. that would would help them with the conversation that this is still a cultural exchange, and we're we're abiding by the visa rules and everything. Absolutely, yes. We we can do it. <laughs> Don? Yeah, I just have a quick question um, related to the presentation before. So I, one of the, the Fulbrighters that's coming in, hopefully, I think, this fall um, from Timor Liste is coming to work with me. If he was mentioned when you were listing off all, or that country was listed, I'm guessing that's him, but um, did he's already then effectively on your radar screen, like Claire, does he, he so will you guys be communicating with him, and do I need to you know, make sure that he checks in or will there already be sort of communication before he arrives? Um, I will get his name. I mean, IIE or the funding agency will send me his name and his TOA and then I can reach out to him and say, when you come here, come and see me in this office. And we're trying to to do, to get the check-in process um, as a virtual um which they can do virtually, so he can send me all this information virtually before he gets seen. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it's been a bit of an interesting process. I guess you all have worked with Christine Chan to some degree, and she was adamant about me not communicating directly with him after like the offer. And yeah. so we sent him an offer letter back in February 9th to the address, the IIE address for him. And I don't know quite how he gets those emails if they somehow get routed through through IIE first because he hasn't responded at, to that. And I've heard absolutely nothing from him since the end of January when we decided it was a uh, you know good for him to move forward. And I and and we've worked out all the the financial side of things um, with Christine, and she said that we were his top choice and it was a really good offer and. But now I'm not a peep since we set that offer letter, you know, a month and a half ago. And it not only is that a little weird for me, not knowing what to plan for for this fall, but, um, you know, it also makes it difficult when it comes to making other offers to other students because that binds up 
funds for, I know they don't actually have to make an, ex, you know, they don't have to accept until April 15th, but mm -hmm. to not hear anything and not know it's, it it's that the process on the IIE side of things, it, it just seems to keep us in the dark a little bit. Do you guys have any input or any suggestions on how um, to navigate that? I wrote that to... down because that's something when we have our meeting with IIE, I think it's something we can address. Um, I had asked um, in the fall if we could have maybe um, up front, um, kind of like a an agreement, uh, unofficial official, where we list each um, entity lists, whether it's the department, the grad school, IIE or Fulbright agency, the contributions and the years the student is here and who's paying what. And um, it, I think it was the same experience you had. It was kind of crickets um, because we were running into in the fall, um, the Bursar and myself, that the terminology, what I consider what our waiver is, full tuition waiver means you're paying the whole thing to their language. And so there was a lot of confusion on what the department should be paying and what IIE should be paying. Um, so I think we're just trying to move in the area of kind of clear communication and consistent throughout, like you're talking about, because they do want, they are the people negotiating and doing the business for the student. They are their advocate, I guess. And it does make it very challenging on our side to kind of get our ducks in a row and what's been offered, what's not been offered. And it's really important that the department sees up front a ballpark of what the funding is coming for, for with the students. So you're right. So you can plan about other students and then what, what you need to build their package up on. So I think that's with our communication and our meeting with IIE on how we move forward with them for kind of clear communication with our departments. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. On a personal note, I would love to meet that student. I mean, I'm Brazilian by birth, so it would I it would really it would be really nice to meet somebody from the more or less. Uh, so sure. He, he's around, please, Claire. Hopefully, it works <laughs> out. I mean, he seemed keen, and she seemed to suggest. But why? You know, it always you know. A month and a half have gone by since he's had the offer letter. So, uh, I, but I don't know. It maybe it's mired in IEE, you know, evaluations and such. I, I just really have no. I idea. think at, the, at this point, the 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 conversation is mainly between IIE and the students. I think Kathleen, they want to control um, the way the students get the information or what they get, so they're not too confused. Gotcha. They're getting yeah. con um, information from one party rather than different parties. Gotcha. Okay, thank you all for showing up. We appreciate um, you coming and participating in this workshop. Um, thank you for supporting our Fulbrights. And if you have any questions, please be sure to email us. Um, but thank you very much. Sounds thank good, you. thanks.